All right, well, good morning. Um, and thanks for the wave, John. So uh, I was gonna say that it, it is a bit hard to read faces and I'm looking out and I can see everybody's eyes. So uh, those of you that are here, usually I look out to the audience and I kind of get a bit of feedback and see, you know, are people picking up what I'm saying or not, you know? So you're gonna have to make sure your eyes are very expressive for me today so I can see. So if you like something, make sure your eyes are smiling. You can glare at me if I say something you don't like. If you're confused, scrunch up your eyebrows or something, but uh, really help me to, uh, to read, the, uh, read the crowd. Um, it is uh, an, an honor and a blessing to be here. Man, it's been since March since we've had a live speaker. So it's great to, uh, to see this starting back up here at the chapel, um, some degree of, nor of normalcy. Um, and as uh, Phil uh, pointed out, we're starting a two-part uh, series on uh, sin and repentance. Uh, so uh, it's an important topic, as Phil mentioned, we don't uh, discuss it uh, often, uh, but we do need to uh, think about sin and the fact that it, it does not have a place uh, in our lives. So uh, that's the topic that we're going to be looking at. Um, you know, sometimes as Christians, we tend to be a little casual about sin. We can talk about being forgiven for it. Sometimes we might something that I deal with. It's, you know, but it's, um, but it's, it's more than a vice. It's, we have to recognize it for what it is and, uh, and know how to deal with sin. Uh, I think also, you know, yesterday there was a session here at the chapel on uh, safety online, you know, and I think uh, as we go through this pandemic, we are more and more um, separated from each other and more and more virtual. And while that's good in some regards in terms of our virtual ability to connect, there's also a, a great deal of danger as we heard yesterday that there is present online. Um, and so uh, we do want to address uh, those points, um, perhaps not uh, head on. I understand that we're, we don't have uh, Sunday school, so we've got uh, kids here. So I'll be careful about uh, the, de the depth to which I talk about uh, sin and our, uh, the influence that sin has, but uh, just to keep that also in the back of our minds, just the danger that uh, the internet can bring in terms of sin. And uh, so uh, essentially today what I want to talk about, I've titled The Insidious Nature of Sin. Um, when uh, Rodney and I and uh, Phil and Dave were uh, talking about this series about a month ago and we kind of got some ideas down, really that word came up, insidious. And uh, I think it's a very uh, apt word. Um, here's the definition of insidious. So insidious is an adjective and it says it's proceeding in a gradual, subtle way, but with harmful effects. Working or spreading harmfully in a subtle or stealthy manner and intended to entrap. Um, I think uh, when I was trying to think of, uh, of a word picture for the idea of something that is insidious, what came to mind is the idea of cigarettes. And I'm not going to speak out today about smoking. I know that some people very much struggle with this. But I think the idea of a cigarette really captures the idea of something that is insidious in that it proceeds gradually. You don't start out with being offered your first cigarette and saying, wow, I really want this to entrap me, to have to spend all of my money to affect my health and perhaps get cancer as a result. You know, um, that's not what kids or adults who start out with a cigarette, that's not how they start. But yet it grows gradually and it it's subtle and it starts off small, but eventually people realize that they're trapped by it. Um, and I think that that is a very good picture of sin and uh, what it does. Um, Another example is just the idea of a frog in water and you can change the temperature of the water until it goes to boiling and the frog won't jump out because it is slowly accustomed to the temperature changing. And so the idea here is really that there is something that is insidious, it is gradual, it is subtle, and it, is, it has harmful effects and is intended to trap. Uh, a few verses here, just putting the definition over on the side as we look at a few verses. We can read James 1, 14 to 16. James 1 would tell us, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. 
Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. And again, you see the idea that it is gradual. When it has conceived, there's a, there's a fullness that comes about to it, that it starts off small. It is enticing, uh, but it brings forth death. Do not be deceived. Uh, again, we can see the idea of that sin is insidious. First uh, Peter 5, 8, we read, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Hebrews 3, 12 reads, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. Again, the idea of a gradual and a harmful effect. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11.14, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's intended to entrap. It might seem okay, but it is a gradual subtleness that comes about with a harmful effect. 1 Timothy 6.9, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare or a trap, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And so really that's the, that's the idea here is that sin is trapping and it is harmful, but it is subtle and it is gradual. I think uh, when in, uh, in Matthew 5, when Jesus is um, doing the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he speaks about that and the seriousness of sin, you know, and, and how we can't just say this is just a small thing. You know, we, we talk about a white lie or a small lie. It's just, it's just a small sin. But he said, he says, no, uh, when you are angry with someone, it is akin to murdering. To murdering. Um, he says, when you look at someone with lust, it is the same as adultery. So he says, there's no such thing as a small sin. They're all the same. But I think he's also pointing out the fact that there's a pattern that, that grows from it. And Sure, we don't end up necessarily being angry in the next day murdering somebody, um, but there is a, a harm that comes from those things. I was trying to think a bit about um, other examples. Uh, obviously, Jesus mentions those two, but we could just as easily say that when we lie, we are stealing because we are being dishonest in our behavior. We're taking something that is not ours, and we're making it into our own definition of a truth. So you could say that when we lie, we are stealing. We could say that when we slander or when we gossip, that it is akin to manslaughter in terms of the fact that we are damaging somebody and their reputation and we are hurting them. Um, when we are complaining, we could, we could liken that to a self-harm. We're killing all the joy that there is around us, and we're killing our own joy and our own ability to enjoy things if we spend our lives in a complaining uh, fashion. Um, and we could just take those examples and just see that there are not, there's no such thing as a small sin, um, and that these are serious matters. Uh, ultimately, the sin that we let in does not satisfy, and it harms us, and it harms those around us. I want to read from 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 through chapter 2 verse 6. So if you've got your Bibles, please turn with me. It's also up on the screen. Um, actually, I think it's big enough there. I can read it from the back. I was going to, it's just big enough. 1 John 1, 5 through 2, 6. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to, get, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. 
into chapter two, and I've highlighted my key verse for today in red. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Before we go any further, let's ask the Lord for our help as we go through this passage. Our Father, we just pause as we've started looking at the seriousness of sin, and we just pray that you would help us this morning as we uh, look into your word, uh, that you would help us recognize the trap which is set before us, and that we would recognize the salvation that is made for us in your Son, our Lord Jesus. And we just pray that each person would come to a saving knowledge of you, uh, but beyond that would also have a, a life of power and victory in you. And so we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the passage in 1 John, actually 1 John itself, is a great book um, to read just to, get, just to read through and look at the, um, the calling that it has on the believer to, uh, to not deal with sin, to not let sin into our lives. Um, even this morning, we, we looked at Romans 6, talking about how sin must not define us, how we're no longer slaves uh, to sin. Um, we, re we read in, in, uh, in the first chapter about darkness. Actually, I'll turn back for, in a sec for, the, for, for a second. That we read in verse 6, that if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And this passage is addressed, uh, it's, it's addressed, I think, to two groups. There's, a, there's the unbeliever who can look at this and say, look, this doesn't, I, I might say that I walk in light, but really I don't. I'm walking in darkness. And really the question here that, um, that is being asked at first is, what is your relationship with the Lord? Do you have fellowship? Have you ever started down that path of fellowship with the Lord? Um, when I think about our social media, we talk often about you know, setting your relationship status. Um, but the, before you do that, there's, I know on Facebook at least, it says, you know, interested. I am interested is usually the first status for those of you who go on Facebook. So the question I would have for us is, first of all, as we're watching this, um, you know, do we simply have an interest in the Lord or do we have a relationship with him? Um, so that would be the first thing that I would grab from 1 John is to say, what is our relationship with the Lord? When we look at this passage, uh, do we see a description of ourselves where we say that we have fellowship but we don't, and we're, and we're walking in darkness, in that case, then we are not uh, in Christ. Uh, however, I think it all, there's also a call here to believers who um, have been saved, but who are walking, who, who, are, who have made a practice um, of sinning. Um, and I think um, that the passage is clear that we cannot have a pattern of sin in the believer's life, that it wrecks that fellowship, it wrecks that relationship, that you cannot maintain a relationship with God if you maintain a life of sin um, in our lives. Um, so really this passage uh, is black and white. I, I don't think it tells us that we can lose our salvation. In fact, I, I can tell you it doesn't mean that we can lose our salvation, but we can lose our fellowship. We can lose the intimacy that comes from our relationship um, with the Lord. So I want to go back to uh, chapter two. I'll move forward two slides because I've written it down again. 
And I want to look at the idea of Jesus as our advocate. So 1 John 2, 1 read, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And my thought was taken to Revelation 12, 10, where um, we have Satan being described. And uh, it reads uh, at the end of verse 10, For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night uh, before our God. And just the idea that we have an advocate and there is an accuser. And my mind kind of went to a courtroom in which on one side you have the accuser, the prosecution who's saying, no, this is this person, this person's uh, a sinner, this person has sinned again, this person has fallen. You have the accuser, the father of lies, who will stand there and accuse us um, before God. But then we have Jesus, who is an advocate. And the job of the advocate uh, is to really to be the person who pulls forth the truth, who brings forth truth in your defense and holds it up and says, no, these are, this is a pile of lies. This is the truth about this person and defends that person um, to the judge. So I kind of want to go with that idea um, and look at um, seven, um, seven lies that Satan holds forward and that can trap us. Lies that we can tell our, ourselves, lies that we hear about ourselves, lies that we can often find ourselves entrapped by and to, and to, um, to turn that around and say, well, what does Jesus say? What does the Bible say about this? So the idea that Jesus is our advocate. If we go back and read again in John 1, we read about walking in light. Uh, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Um, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Um, And just the idea that light exposes, uh, light exposes the truth exposes the lies for what they are. It brings forward the truth. You know, I think of a flashlight when I'm out camping and you grab a really powerful flashlight and all of a sudden you can see everything around you. Um, A noise that's in the bush, all of a sudden you can illuminate and you can see that it's a raccoon or worse, a skunk. Um, And it shows you the truth of what is out there. Um, I think about Jesus when he was in the wilderness and Satan came uh, to tempt him And how did Jesus refute Satan? He refuted him with the words of scripture. And so that is the strategy that we're going to take today. We're told to walk in light. And so uh, we're going to uh, essentially do that now. We're going to shine a light on the lies and see see if we, where we can go from there. So let's look at the first one. So this is uh, number one. Again, I've put the definition of insidious, um, up at the top for all of this so you can be just reminded about this so here's the first lie that satan would tell us satan would tell us well it's not a big deal it's just a small sin or he would say hey you can handle it it's not a problem um and again going back to the idea of uh casual sin um uh, we we can tell ourselves no it won't trap me Uh, this is not a sin that's going to trap me i've got power over this i've got this um, but in reality, when we read First Peter 5, 8, we read that your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So the truth is um, that, that uh, sin is harmful and we cannot control it. It is like a lion, um, not just a lion that can be tamed. This is a roaring lion. You cannot stop a roaring lion. That lion is looking for food. It is looking to devour. And yet we sometimes treat sin um, just like a little cat. You know, I'll throw a little barn, a ball of yarn out at it and no big deal. But the Bible would be very clear um, that it is uh, harmful and intended to trap us. When we think about the harmful effects of sin, uh, we can think about a number of them. We can think about the broken relationships uh, with others that can cause from sin, uh, those that we hurt, um, those that we disappoint, those who we sin against. 
Um, and we don't even need to be sinning against other people. We can just be disappointing other people and hurting people uh, in our relationship. Uh, we can think about, um, you know, um, sin that has become public um, and that it hurts others and, and disappoints them. Um, broken relationships with God. We read in 1 John about uh, fellowship and walking in fellowship with God. Uh, and we can think about ways that that can impact us, how a ministry can become unfruitful when a life is filled with sin, how um, your own life can be unfruitful. There can be a lack of joy and a lack of peace. Um, and while we live and while we uh, allow sin into our lives, we can often be, uh, we can have a loss of peace. Um, even though we know that we are uh, saved, we still wonder, well, I wonder if that was one sin, you know, that is not forgivable, or I've done this so many times, I wonder if this can be forgiven. You lose that sense of peace and you lose that sense of joy. Um, you lose, uh, like I've mentioned already, fellowship uh, with God. Um, there's a loss of confidence in prayer. Um, how hard is it to, um, to go to God in prayer uh, when we're allowing sin into our own lives, you know? Um, if you sin against somebody, the last thing you want to do is look at them in the eye. Um, and so you're not, uh, it, sin dwelling in your life um, loses confidence in prayer. It loses your ability or your desire to want to go to God because um, you will have to now face what you have done. Um, and there's no excitement about his coming. Um, I think about um, the parable uh, in which uh, Jesus says, you know, he doesn't, you don't know when the, uh, when the groom is coming, you know, and there, there's the uh, bridesmaids, I should have written this down, uh, but uh, with the lanterns, you know, and they were not looking forward to his coming. Um, and I think that sin in a believer's life can take away that joy, that anticipation for the coming of the Lord Jesus, because, you know, I don't want to be doing sin when my master comes to take me home. Um, and so certainly we are not looking forward to the Lord's coming when we are dabbling with sin, when we are allowing sin to get into our lives, when, we're, um, when we are succumbing to uh, vices, when we are uh, allowing sin and when we're looking at a sin as an escape mechanism, um, any of those things where it takes away from our relationship with God. It also has the harmful effects of just our own self, you know, our own self-loathing, reproach, regret, um, and we take it out on ourselves. And then there's also the, the victims um, of those of our sin, those who we have sinned against. Um, and uh, even uh, when I think about, uh, we're, we're, we talk about uh, the internet, and you know, you could say, well, uh, stuff that I, I watch online, you know, that there's no victims. Well, no, there are victims there too. Um, and, you know, whether it's in the trafficking industry and things like that, there are always victims to sin. There is no sin that does not have a victim. Uh, it breaks things, it traps, and it damages. Um, so sin has harmful effects. It is a lion. So when we see the lie that it's no big deal, turn that around with 1 Peter 5 eight. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour it is a big deal and we need to treat sin as a big deal every sin little sin that we term little is not little we need to treat sin for what it is and make sure that it is not taking root uh, in our lives the second lie that i would uh, present here is the idea that you've got this under control you can handle this. It's, it's, not, it's not a big one. You know, I, I hear people talk about, well, it doesn't dominate me or it doesn't control me. Um, when you think about uh, certain addictions, people that say, well, no, I can quit when I want to. Um, oh, I got this, you know. Um, the picture that I've got here, actually, I'll read the verse first. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And I think that we can be, um, we can be um, prone to doing this, where we can say, no, no, I've got this. And the idea here is saying, I've got this. Um, Ephesians 6.10 tells us, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. So he tells us to stand, not on our own, but to stand in the Lord. 
Uh, we read this morning uh, in Romans 8 uh, that we are more than conquerors through him. And just the idea that let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I put a photo up here of a pile of chairs. I don't know, maybe as a kid you remember doing this, but climbing up on top of a pile of chairs and you go from one stack to the other. And it's quite easy for a moment to think that you stand while being atop those chairs. And then they start crumbling and crashing down around you. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I remember as a kid experiencing a pile of chairs collapsing below me, you know, and I thought that I had this. I thought I was good, you know. My parents had warned me not to climb on top of it, and yet I climbed up and the pile of chairs came, came crumbling down. We cannot stand on our own. So when Satan would say, you've got this, don't worry about this, God would say, no, you don't got this, uh, for lack of, uh, for, to put it into uh, some plainer text. Uh, Be strong in the Lord and strength of his might. Um, I think a lot about, uh, and as well, into our own safeguards that we would want to put up. We say, no, no, I've got this. Um, I can put up a number of safeguards. Um, we can think about um, just uh, the parameters that we can put into place ourselves. And we think about, um, you know, when it comes to um, online, I'll use that reference again, um, just the idea of putting various safety parameters in place. And those are great but in and of themselves, if we are not standing in the Lord and the strength of his might, those are just uh, parameters that we're putting in place for ourselves to stand in our own power, to literally put ourselves standing on top of a pile of chairs and say, look at me, I've got this. And then we're surprised when our pile of chairs falls over. Um, so that would be the second lie and the second um, truth. A third lie that we could look at is the idea that you've been forgiven, so it doesn't matter what you do. Um, growing up in the church, I think this is one that um, really that I had to get had to get past, you know, um, where um, just the idea that I was raised this way, I was always going to church, I was a believer, and Jesus forgives my sin, and so I'm going to heaven. And just the idea of, I put up there the uh, a get out of jail free card from the game Monopoly. Just the idea that we're saved, we're going to heaven. You know, um, I've heard it described as fire insurance. You know, I've got my insurance so that I don't go to hell. Great. And now I can sin without repercussion. Um, we've already discussed the fact that you cannot sin without repercussion. There will be consequences. Um, but you cannot... Um, just say that you've been forgiven and it doesn't matter uh, what you do. Um, let's pull up a number of verses actually on this one. First John 2, 4 says, whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. First John 3, 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. 1 John 5.18, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. And just the idea that we cannot just say, I'm forgiven, so what? Um, no, it says, uh, 1 John 3, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. We cannot make a practice of sinning. Romans 6 tells us, shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. Um, I was struck a few weeks back, or reminded a few weeks back, when uh, Jerry Libby was speaking about uh, how to study your Bible. And for those of you who caught it on the Tuesday nights, um, the first message uh, where we tuned in to hear how to study your Bible, if you'll recall, gave actually not a single point as to how to study your Bible, but reminded us that the importance of studying your Bible was based, first of all, on the relationship that you have with the Lord, that you can try to study your Bible and have all of these methods and all of these things in place, but if the relationship is not there, you know, you need to start at that relationship. And we need to do the same thing when it comes here, that we need to go back and say, well, 
if we're trying to tackle sin head on, and I don't want sin in my life, where does that start? It starts at a relationship with the Lord Jesus. Um, we cannot make a practice of sinning. We need to say, this is who I am. Do I have fellowship with Christ? Am I in that relationship as we've discussed a few minutes ago? And if so, then we don't treat sin as if we have a get out of jail free card. We treat sin for what it is because we no longer want that sin in our lives. We have that relationship with the Lord. Now, I want to flip a bit to a flip side of the argument, and it's the idea that you've messed up too bad this time. You're too far gone. So Satan would love to have us sit there and question our salvation. So while the, fir the, while the first ones here have challenged us to look at our relationship and look at our status with the Lord, if I can put it that way, what is our relationship? Now, the other danger is that we, qu we keep questioning that relationship. Am I saved? Have I sinned too much? Am I now, have I now gone too far in my past recovery? Um, the, uh, the picture that I would use is the idea of a GPS. You know, and a GPS, I think, is a great, uh, a, a great analogy here. It's the idea that when you miss your off-ramp, it'll recalculate. It'll give you another chance to still get to your destination. I think that uh, that, that can kind of be an encouragement to us to say that, no, we've never, we have not messed up too bad for us to be brought back, for us to be saved, for us to continue on the path that God wants for us. Um, yes, occasionally we'll miss our turn, and then we will be recorrected. God will come alongside the scripture. Other believers will come alongside and point it out. Uh, we read in 1 John 1, if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, I think about in John, when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, you know, and John said, no, no, don't, don't, uh, don't wash me, um, you know. Uh, and Jesus said, no, no, listen. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase here. He says that I do, if you are saved... You don't need to be washed fully, but your feet need to continually come back and be, keep coming back to the Lord and keep uh, confessing your sins. Um, so confession is a continual process. The idea that we keep coming back, um, it's not just that salvation that we come to the cross and we lay it down once and for all and then leave everything at the cross and go on to live our lives, but we come back to the cross. There's a, we there's a reason why on a weekly basis, uh, we are called back together to remember what the Lord did for us uh, in the breaking of bread and, uh, and the wine. Um, we are called back not only to remember his sacrifice, but also to come and to keep short accounts with the Lord. Um, and so um, we have not sinned too badly to ever come back to the Lord uh, Jesus. Um, so... Yeah, so when Satan would tell us, no, you've messed up too bad, you're too far gone, that is a lie. We can always come back to Christ. And so if you have sin that you are dealing with and it keeps tearing, taking you down, keep coming back to God uh, and keep confessing it uh, to him. Um, lie number five, you did it again, you're never going to get past this. Just the idea um, of, well, you know, you might as well just give up. Um, you know, you've fallen off those chairs again. Um, and in the verse that I don't have much of a illustration for this one, but the verse that I wanted to pull out uh, was one that we shared this morning during the Lord's Supper. And it was, uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And just the idea of, you know, we can get discouraged. Oh, I sinned again, or I've done this again. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think about Paul who talks about the, the warring nature of the two desires that are within him, you know. Um, and and just, uh, just the fact that we have these two natures that war at, each, at one another um, or at ourselves. But yet we have a conqueror that lives inside of us. Uh, in all these things, it is him who conquers uh, for us. The sixth one that I want to look at is 
uh, the lie that your past defines you. You know, and we hear that. That's just who you are. Um, Jeff this morning reminded us about the fact that we are no longer uh, slaves to sin, but yet often we live as if we're slaves to sin. I've put a photo up here about uh, an, an electronic fence. If, you're, if any of you have pets and you've put in one of these, uh, it, the concept is quite simple. There's a wire that runs underground and a collar on the dog that warns the dog when he gets close to, um, gets close to the wire. And at first you put up these little flags and it warns the dog to stay away because the dog associates the flags to the area. And you slowly pull up flags. And eventually you can pull up all the flags. You can even turn the collar off eventually. Um, and the dog will be so trained, knowing that he can't approach that spot in the yard, that he'll never go there again. And even when you turn the electric fence off or the electric coils off, which would give the dog its, uh, a little shock on its uh, neck, um, the dog still won't cross. And I think sometimes we're like that, you know? The, the fence is off, the trap is gone. We are free from that trap. That trap is no more but yet we live as if we are still inside of that trap. We still um, live in that bondage. Uh, let's look at a few verses. But we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That is what defines us. It is not our past that defines us. It is not our sin that defines us. What defines us is that we are a new creation in Christ. Galatians 2 reads, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is no longer I who live. Uh, Ephesians 4.22 says to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in, by the, sorry, in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And I think often we, we make the mistake of defining ourselves by our past, by our mistakes, um, you know, we say, this is just who I am. It's a part of who I am. It's, this is my struggle. This is me. But no, we can look and say, no, we have a power that is greater than our past. We have a power that is greater than sin. And Jesus Christ has given us a new life. One that is not defined by our, by our past, but is defined by our future. It's our future that defines us. We are told that our citizenship is of heaven. That is where our citizenship is. In, Phil in Philippians 3 is where we read that. We have a citizenship in heaven. We are a new creation, and it is not our sin and our past that defines us. And so we should look to sin, and when sin comes calling, we say, no, that is not who I am anymore. This is not me. This does not define me. What defines me is Jesus. And it is my relationship with Jesus, and it is my future with Jesus. That defines me. And I do not have to say yes to sin because I have that power inside of me. It is not the past that defines us. The final lie that I want to look at this morning is the idea that you're on your own in this. And there's two truths that I want to look at that counter this claim. The first one is Hebrews 4.15 where we read, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And obviously the key there is yet without sin. You know, Jesus did not have a sinful nature the way that we have a nature that wars against us. But yet he was tempted. He can sympathize with us. He understands uh, what we're going through. And when we look to him, as we've done this morning, uh, we look to the pattern that he sets for us. We can see that when he was tempted, his pattern was to answer those temptations with the word of God, which is why it's so important that we stay in the word of God, that we keep that habit up of following in the word of God, because it's the word of God that Jesus used when he was refuting Satan. And those are the words, those verses that we have used this morning as we, put up, we have put them up on screen, those words of scripture that we can use to refute Satan when he comes and tempts us, or when he comes with those lies about us, um, we can use uh, those words um, to our advantage. Um, we often, 
as kids, we memorize a lot of verses. I think as adults, we don't necessarily spend too much time talking about the memory verse for the day. I think we should, you know, I think all of these verses, and at the end, I've put a few up on the screen. I think uh, the ones that we have there, that we should take the time to memorize those and have those in our back pocket and ready um, to refute Satan when he, when he tempts us, when we are tempted. Um, and just to know that we are not on our own in this. Um, we have a savior who can sympathize with us and, um, and who is able to uh, defend us as well. The other truth is that we are not alone in this in terms of the fact that we have one another. James 5.16 reads, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. You know, we were reminded today um, in the kids' message about uh, praying for one another. And just the idea of praying for one another and confessing our sins to one another. And I think that for some reason, we tend to think that, you know, that we are the first person to struggle with sin, that I'm the only one that deals with this. Um, and we don't talk to others about it. I remember uh, in university, just speaking with the other college and careers guys, and you just, okay, you know, we all deal with the exact same thing, you know, and once we had it out in the open, we were able to help each other out uh, in terms of um, helping each other stay accountable in terms of our study, in terms of our, um, in terms of our, our struggles with sin, and just in terms of our relationship with God. And so I would encourage you, if you don't have somebody uh, with which uh, you are accountable or which you can go to and confide in or to ask for help, uh, that you find that person, um, you know, and just to, just to find that ability um, to confess and have that person pray for you and you for them and work together and just say, this is where I struggle. Can I help you where you struggle? And I think once we expose it, once we um, identify what it is that we are dealing with and what it is in our own lives, then we have the ability to recognize it for what it is and have somebody come alongside and help us with it. And so the lie that we are alone in this, that this is, you know, you're the first person to ever struggle with sin. No, that's a lie. You are not the first person. Um, you know, I think about Paul who would say, oh, wretched man that I am. Um, you know, and he would call himself uh, um, a sinner of which he is the ch uh, of chief of sinners. You know, and you would look at Paul and say, really, you know, but Paul recognized that he was a sinner. Um, we need to recognize that we are sinners. We are not the first ones to go through this, and we are not alone uh, in this. So I want to go back just to the start about walking in the light. That was what um, first, John, first John encouraged us, not to walk in darkness, but to walk in the light. And really the idea is, is that it is walking is an active verb. Um, it, it is not just... Uh, just being in the light, but it is walking in the light. There is, mo there is movement, there is motion. It is an, an active word. Um, so we need to be walking actively in the light. How do we do that? We need to stop listening to the lies. So when the lies come, here, come in, we need to recognize them for what they are and refute them with the truth, to refute a sin with the word of God and to live in that truth. We also need to make sure that we don't give sin a foothold, that we don't, uh, you know, I think we all recognize the areas in our lives in which uh, we can easily be led uh, into sin. And we need to avoid those areas. We need to not give sin a foothold. Uh, we need to not pull, put that ball of yarn out in front of the lion as if we're just going to play with sin for a bit. We do not play with sin. Don't give sin a foothold. We need to be accountable. We've already discussed that. Accountable to each other, accountable to the Lord. And same thing with confession, confession to one another and confession to the Lord. And uh, we, we need to repent. We need to turn from our sin. Uh, Rodney next week is going to be looking uh, at repentance. So I won't go too much further into detail on this one, uh, but we need to be uh, in repentance and we need to abide um, in the Lord. As I mentioned, I wanted to close with a few verses that we've looked at these verses already. Uh, but I would encourage you to take those verses, um, to jot them down to, um, if you can, or screenshot it if you're at home, and look these verses up um, and memorize them and be able to quote them 
in the face of scripture, right? or sorry, in the face of scripture, using scripture in the face of sin. Uh, sin is not trivial. You cannot stand on your own strength. I meant to add Ephesians 6.10 to that slide. So right after 1 Corinthians 10.12, you can add Ephesians 6.10 um, on that slide. Um, habitual sin has no place in a believer's life. You are never too far gone to come back. You can't stand on your own, but you can stand with Christ. You are defined by Christ and not your past. You are not alone. Uh, a verse in closing, just from Psalms, we read that we have escaped like a bird from a hunter's trap. The trap is broken and we are free. And my prayer here today is that as we've shone the light on Satan's trap, that the trap would be broken in each of our lives. And that you would look to our lives and realize that the trap is broken. Like the dog that has the um, fence turned off, that trap is no more. The trap is broken and we are free. And we need to live in that freedom. Um, and I pray that we could each live a life of freedom uh, in the Lord. As I close in prayer, I'll put that uh, one slide back up with the, uh, with the verses. And I'll close in prayer. And then we will uh, have a song that we'll, uh, we'll play and then we'll be dismissed. So let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that the scripture that you have provided gives us all that we need. It gives us the answers that we can turn to um, and just the encouragement that we need uh, to live our lives. And so we thank you uh, that you uh, can sympathize with us. We thank you that we are not alone. We thank you uh, for the truth that we are able to um, shine um, into our own lives that we can recognize that the trap that Satan has set for us we, we recognize that it is broken that you have broken it the victory is yours uh, that we have that victory in you and we just pray that we would live that life of victory in you and we just pray that you would uh, part us now with your blessing as we, uh, as we part so we pray this in Jesus name Amen